Over the past few millennia, Croton Point has been known by a host of names. Navish, Sanasqua, Sarah's Point, and Teller's Point are a few that come to mind. Jutting two miles into the widest part of the Hudson, it is arguably the river's most distinctive feature. It takes its name from the Kichewank Indian chief Croton and is said to mean the wind. In 1609, when Hudson sailed the half moon up the river, it was then called Mahikanatuck, which meant the river which flows both ways. It was once the site of a great fortified Kichewank village and later became the home of the first European settlers in the region. Along the promontory now dotted with cabins was a fortified village constructed to protect the oyster beds which encircled the point. By the 1630s, many of the Lower River tribesmen had fallen victim to a whole host of illnesses, including smallpox, malaria, and influenza that were previously unknown to them. Entire villages were annihilated since the natives lacked immunity to foreign diseases. Before Stephanus Van Cortland started buying the land that became the manor, William and Sarah Teller obtained permission from the native peoples to establish a trading post at the southern tip of the point. By 1682, the title had been conveyed to Cornelius Van Bursum, and by 1686, the property was in the hands of the Van Cortlands. Through most of the Revolutionary War, it remained under the control of the colonists. It was, however, the scene of high drama one fateful day when the British warship Vulture, en route to wrest control of West Point, was thwarted by cannons fired from Croton Point. Local militiamen John Peterson is credited with foiling Benedict Arnold and Major Andre's nefarious plan, and some say this may have altered the course of the war. In 1804, much of the point was purchased by Robert Underhill. He was a Quaker and owner of flour mills along the Croton River. He raised melons, apples, and castor beans. After his death, his two sons divided up the property. The doctor gave up his practice and developed a thriving vineyard brother W.A. Underhill confined his energies to the northern section of the point where a village developed around his brickyard. It featured a school, a tavern, a grocery, and a boarding house for seasonal workers. Around the turn of the century, the point underwent a series of ownership changes during which it played host to a variety of camps, conveyances, and amusements. Judge Decker of Croton leased the point in the 20s and operated it as the Croton Point Club. Meanwhile, the brickyard continued to operate until the clay pits were exhausted in 1915. By 1924, the point had become the property of Westchester County, which sadly began using it as a dump. It was a horrific environmental assault on the point which would last for more than 60 years. Christopher Letts, a noted Hudson River authority, discusses that sad time. Good morning. I'm Christopher Letts, and we are at Croton Point Park. In my estimation, one of the gems of the Hudson River. When I'm working with school groups, and there's one due in about three minutes. I point to my little pickup truck and I say, that's my office, you're in it. And my office changes every day. I'm up and down the river and on both sides of it, from the Bear Mountain Bridge to the George Washington Bridge, in all seasons and in all weathers, doing different kinds of programs. I feel most at home right here at Croton Point. I just love this piece of real estate. It used to be 100 and uh, 
50 acres of, of marsh and about 300 acres of, of what they would call fast land. But um, now it's, it's almost all fast land. Uh, the marshes have been filled with, with garbage and that's changed things out here. But it's a storied place um, and I could point in almost any direction and spin you a yarn. Over there on that hillside, you can find the outcroppings of millions and millions of oyster shells with associated Indian artifacts, uh, Algonquian artifacts. Those were left there two and three and four thousand years ago by the first peoples who, who lived here. Down this way a quarter of a mile past the park office is a place called Money Hill. It's gone now. Um, the county in all its wisdom used it to cap the first of the Croton dump, the one they call Railroad One. And I asked Henry Gordeen, the, the senior fisherman and the senior philosopher on the Hudson River, oh, maybe 20 years ago, I said, uh, where was Money Hill? Well, it's gone, he said. I said, why did they call it Money Hill? Well, there was supposed to be money buried under it. Well, did they find any money? No, and it serves them right. That was what Henry's take was. And that same day, he took me down to the south shore of the point, and he pointed to some broken cement abutments in the sand, and he said, this was the Macy's family seaplane dock back in the 20s. They were one of the first families in this country to have a private commuter plane to fly them back and forth to New York City. What we were really looking for was the remnants of the foundations of the building he was born in more than 100 years ago, the old brick fish house. And we looked and we looked and he said, well, things have changed a lot. And they do change. They change here at Croton Point. They change slowly. A little bit later on, we were out on what people call Sarah's Point, or, or Southwest Point, and we were looking out across the curve of the Croton Reef, the, the stony uh, projection that lies underwater except at the very lowest of tides, and curls out for an eighth of a mile. And he said, I remember my father bringing me here and, and talking about the schooner Bluebird and how she st struck fast in a February gale and the water was so rough that for three days nobody could get out to her. She was only an eighth of a mile offshore, but no boat could live in that surf, he said. The worst that can happen to a piece of land and a piece of water has happened out here, and the best as well. It's, it's just a fantastic place to come. I would say avoid it between 10 o'clock and 4 o'clock on summer weekends, and come instead when there's a full moon rising in the evening um, sometime in September or October. Go up on top of what I call the dump, but they insist as a landfill, and watch the sunset behind the Palisades, and you'll be a different person. I, I guarantee you it'll last for at least 24 hours. Come here in the wintertime. Come here in January and take an early morning walk when the ground is crunching under your feet and watch the eagles wake up as they come down from their roosts on the Croton River and start searching for their breakfast out uh, on, on Croton Bay. Right now, I just pointed out to the kids the first batch of Orioles, the first flight of Orioles of the year, singing in the willow trees right over our heads. They weren't here yesterday, and they're here now, paying us back by eating, eating bugs. Croton Point's a good place. 213 kinds of fish swim past this point. The best blue crabbing in the fall is right here. Migratory birds come in the spring and the fall, and Croton Point sticks out halfway across the river. If you're a bird, and you're flying at a thousand feet and you look down, what you see is a safe gangway to the west bank of the river in the fall of the year. And birds, in my imagination, from Maritime Canada and all of the Northeast funnel down to take a deep breath, fly a little harder, ha, safe on the rock one side, and on their way to their wintering grounds. And in the spring, the same thing happens in reverse. It's a great place. Croton Point native Henry Gordine recalls an era before the point was fouled by the county's waste. I was born over on Croton Point in uh, January the 7th, 1903. So that makes me a pretty old goat, huh? Brickyard was still in operation when I was big enough to go over to the point sometimes with my, my dad as we moved over, over on the Croton River. And uh, we used to, where you see the dump there now, with it's all covered, there used to be a maze of creeks. And you could row from the Croton River down under the bridge, the railroad was there then, and 
go through this these bunch of creeks and come over to where the road crosses be, by the bathing beach. And then he used to tie his boat to a tree and walk a short distance away, and that was one of the engine houses where that, that he worked in. Once in a great while, he used to go over there with my father, and uh, he used to lift me up so that I could blow the whistle, you know, to wake the men up. And uh, the trouble was is, when I got a hold of that whistle cord, I wouldn't let go. <laughs> Years of protest ensued in what was arguably the start of the environmental movement. Theodore Cornu's Hudson Valley Echoes, and later Pete Seeger's Clearwater Movement, brought clarity and focus to the cause and eventually dumping ceased in the 1980s. Today, the park is pristine, the water is much cleaner, and the so-called jewel of the county's park system is now booked nearly every weekend with travelers from near and far, enjoying its endless variety of recreational and cultural activities.